Hello, hello, this is Derek from One of Your Tea. Welcome back to another episode of Tea Soup, a podcast all about tea culture, life in modern China, and Chinese tea. I'm your host, Derek Poskin. I've been living in China since 2016, and I've been drinking, buying, and selling Chinese tea for the past decade. So, pop on that kettle, heat up your teaware, and let's get this session started. So today in this episode, what I want to talk about is the history of tea. Tea has a long-reaching history in China, predating a lot of primary source material. And so when we look at the history of tea, what we're forced to do is use logic, use inference, and a lot of secondary sources in order to separate the myth from reality surrounding the history of tea. So if you thought you knew about tea's history, then get ready for your understanding to be reshaped a bit in this episode. Naturally, the history of tea is way too big of a topic for a single 20-minute podcast episode, so I'll have to go back to this in later sessions, so bear with me as this very brief overview. What I want to do right now is give us a working understanding of the history of tea in China so that we can talk a little more about how its history has affected modern tea culture. Now, according to my research and my understanding, tea in China can essentially fall into three main eras, tea in prehistory, tea in medi medieval times, and tea in pre-modern slash modern times. By tea in prehistory, what I mean is tea in ancient times all the way just up until before the Tang Dynasty. So that's three, 4,000 BC, maybe up until 600 AD. Tea in medieval times, this is the height of new tea. This is the Tang Dynasty, the Song Dynasty, right around when Liu Yu was writing his classic of tea. This is about 600 to 1200 AD. And then finally, when we get into tea in modern and pre-modern times, this is really what happened right around the fall of the Yuan Dynasty, the beginning of the Ming Dynasty. This is when tea becomes what we would recognize as tea today. This is the loose leaf, this is de-enzymated, this is shelf-stable tea. And this didn't really come around until right around the mid to late 1300s. Now, why have I broken up tea into these three eras? Well, it's because the, the tea we know today didn't exist until the last period. It wasn't until the Ming Dynasty, the late Yuan Dynasty, that de-enzymated tea really came around. And so the primeval counterpart of tea was this poorly processed, semi-oxidized, unstable tea cake that would be ground and brewed as powder. And yes, sometimes they'd add milk and butter, salt and onions, but it's very different from the tea that we drink today. And this is Lu Yu's tea. And the prehistoric tea, on the other hand, is really just no different from any other medicinal herb. Afforded the same place in Shen Nong's Ben Cao Jing, his Materia Medica classic, as burdock root or dandelion leaf, really just any other medicinal herb, that's where tea was at the time. It even had a different name. It was called Tu instead of Cha. And the character is slightly different. And also that character's origin is unknown because it could refer to a lot of other bitter herbs at the time. So let's get into the prehistory of tea, going back as far as we can with the most often bit of recited tea mythology. Tea is first discovered by Shen Nong. Shen Nong is one of these mythic god kings of Chinese prehistory, one of the five ancient emperors. Before any type of written history happens, he's sampling all of the different herbs. He's teaching humans how to farm. He's the divine husbandman. And he's, like I said earlier, he's praised for sampling all the different herbs and vegetables, finding out whether or not they're beneficial to humans, whether they're toxic to humans, and also deciphering their different yin and yang energies, if they're hot energies or cold energies. And what's really interesting about this is even though it's from prehistory, it still manifests itself in modern tea understanding where green teas are considered cooling energies, red teas are considered warming energies. And so while I'll kind of break down why Shen Nong may or may not exist and why this mythic origin of tea is probably not the most reliable, its influence is still present in the modern tea world. So the old story that a lot of people know is that Shen Nong was sleeping off a poisonous reaction he had from sampling one of these 10,000 herbs and he's sleeping under a tree, he's boiling some water to drink, and the leaves from the tree or a nearby bush are blown by wind into the pot. And he smells the fragrant brew, and he decides, you know, in his pioneering spirit to sample the brew, and he finds that not only is it palatable, but it's also starting to purge him of the toxins he's feeling. 
And what's really interesting about this is we get a very specific date associated with this discovery of tea, 2737 BCE, which is pretty bizarre, all things considered. So when we're considering the curious dating customs of ancient China and the uh, Chinese culture, Chinese history, getting a very specific date like this is a bit surprising, especially considering AD and BC are modern dating conventions that are superimposed upon ancient Chinese dating conventions. So in the past, the Chinese often calculated dates by dynasties, by emperors, or even by momentous moments that happened during the emperor's rule. And so... Every now and then an emperor would on occasion just reset time itself for the common people if something bad happened. For example, if there was a great flood, if there was a war, a superstitious emperor might announce the dawn of a new era once the flood was resolved or the enemy armies were vanquished. Thus, instead of getting an easy date like 764 AD, Chinese historians would instead see the notes dating something like the second year of the Guangda era, second year of Daizhong of Tong, or the 57th year of the Tang dynasty, thus requiring a lot of cross-analysis and computing to get any form of a digestible date like 764 AD, let alone something that happened 2,500, 2,600 years ago. And also without mentioning the fact that the earliest contiguous date that we get with these kind of eras and these dynasties only goes back as far as uh, about 140 BCE in the Han Dynasty. So the fact that we can get a precise date for the discovery of T, 2737, is just absolutely absurd. <laughs> it's just really funny to see such a very precise date in such an aqueous kind of time. Additionally, there's a lot of evidence dating the text that is often associated with Shen Nong, the... Ben Saojing, his Materia Medica classic, that it was actually compiled right around 200 AD. This is right around the Han Dynasty, the late Han Dynasty, and this actually checks out because this is after the codification of China and Chinese. This is right after the Qin Dynasty, and this is when the Han culture is kind of coming together. It's bringing all the elements from all the disparate regions, all the warring states unified, and so they're consolidating their weights, their measurements, their language, and of course, they're bringing together all of the scientific knowledge they have, the, the pre-scientific knowledge they have, like the medicine books and stuff. And so to get this medicinal book together probably happened right around the Han Dynasty. And so while we get essentially reliable evidence that tea was drunk and tea was known by this time, the fact that Shen Nong knew about it, discovered it, wrote about it is kind of questionable and up in the air. Thus, when we're looking at ancient Chinese tea, I think it's fair to say that tea was known and consumed in prehistoric times, maybe for thousands of years before its first written mention. It wasn't a luxury product. It wasn't a social beverage. It was medicine. It was, it was known to people who know medicine. It was known to people in localized clusters where it grew naturally, probably, probably in the south, probably in the west, in, in Sichuan regions, and Yunnan regions. But it wasn't tea as we know it today. And this is what I mentioned earlier, where it was even not called tea until right around Lu Yu's time, the Tong. It was called Tu, which could have been any type of bitter medicine, bitter herb. And so it still has a really long way to go before it becomes the shelf-stable, de-enzymated, whole loose-leaf, dried tea leaf product we know today as tea. And so for me, it still doesn't it really exist as tea, until the Ming Dynasty, until the modern, pre-modern times. But let's see what it looks like in the medieval times, in the Tang Dynasty, in the Song Dynasty. Let's see what Lu Yu was drinking and, and gushing about in his tea classic. So before we get into Lu Yu and the rise of tea in the Tang Dynasty, I really want to give a shout out to the people that were really behind bringing tea to the front before Lu Yu's time, and this is actually the Buddhists. This is the Buddhist monasteries. These are the monks and the laymen who aren't drinking wine, and they have their own isolated cultures in the mountains. They're growing tea on these mountainous slopes because tea, unlike rice patties, unlike a lot of different, er different plants like corn or wheat, it doesn't require flat land. It can grow on mountainsides. And so I was reading this fantastic book called Tea in China, A Religious and Cultural History of Tea, by James A. Ben, published by the Hong Kong University Press. And he really 
enlightens me about this idea that Buddhists are the ones that are bringing tea throughout China pre-Tang dynasty. And it makes a lot of sense because the Buddhists have their own niche cultures, their own hierarchies, their own social structure and stuff like that. And they're not drinking wine. They're not interacting with the outside world. And they're also making pilgrimages to other monasteries throughout China. And so what could happen in one small monastery in Sichuan could spread throughout China by these traveling monks on pilgrimage, could bring a couple tea seeds, could plant tea in the mountains where tea grows best. And then a lot of the time, the origin of tea in different locations, especially we'll see this in the Ming Dynasty, come from Buddhist monasteries. And a lot of the famous types of teas all originate around Buddhist monasteries. And so Liu Yu himself was an orphan that was raised by a Buddhist until he ran away and joined the circus. But backing off Liu Yu for a moment, let's really consider tea in Buddhist monasteries. Now, there's a huge connection in history between Buddhists and tea, Buddhist monasteries and tea, tea growth and tea cultivation. But let's kind of look at their own origin myths of tea because what's interesting just as China had to baptize tea in ancient history with Shen Nong and, and Liu, Liu Yu did a lot of work to do this, the Buddhists had to do this themselves because Buddhism came from India, and at that time, India didn't have any tea. And so there's no mention about this drink that's slowly being incorporated into the religious lives of these monastic uh, people. And they have to essentially sanctify this. They have to put it into the scriptures retroactively. And so they have this uh, this story, this ori origin myth about the, the creation of tea from Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma is the father of Zen Buddhism, bringing Buddhism all throughout China. He fell asleep one day when he was meditating and he was so furious with himself that he cut his eyelids off. He cut his eyelids off, they fell to the ground, and from those two eyelids grew the first two tea plants. And he realized drinking this, making tea keeps him alert, keeps him awake, and helps him meditate. And so this essentially sanctifies tea to the Buddhists and really puts it in its place in the Buddhist cosmos. So this is all important to mention because by the time the Tang Dynasty arrives, tea and tea culture has already been accepted, sanctified, and codified, and integrated within Buddhist temples and within monastic life. And so, enter the golden era of tea the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty was between 618 AD and 907 AD, and the crowning jewel of tea during this time is Liu Yu's Tea Classic, which was written in, right in the smack dab in the middle of it, of the Tang Dynasty in 760. Now, as I mentioned, Liu Yu was an orphan. He was brought up by a Buddhist monk, and so he was indoctrinated into the mysteries of tea at a very early age, but he really didn't like monastic life. It wasn't for him. And so he ran away, as I mentioned, to the circus of all things. And so he gets his understanding of how to write, how to create, how to instruct by writing silly handbooks and silly dramas. And he actually gets paid by essentially these lobbyists who are tea farmers that are trying to push tea into the public. And he gets a commission to write this handbook of tea. And I don't want to even want to go into it very much because it's it's a whole other episode in itself, but he essentially creates the whole tea culture from start to finish in this little handbook, and it's it becomes a staple piece in all the literati throughout China going forward in the next couple dynasties. And it actually tea actually becomes so popular in China by 780, you know, 20 years after the the writing of this handbook, the first tea tax comes around. Now, what does tea look like at this time? Pan frying tea was not around. De-enzymating tea was not around. They were steaming it and pressing it into cakes that could be ground up and brewed and frothed. And you can add other things to it. Lu Yu talks about how he doesn't like it when people add this or that to it, but a lot of people do. Around this time as well, you get a lot of naysayers that say like tea is not as good as fermented milk and, and stuff like that. And like tea is actually very harmful for you. And so tea is not this this panacea of the time it's it's this new thing that's Liu Yu's trying to sanctify trying to create tea culture and there are a lot of people that aren't accepting it because it's a new drink 
Now with the advent of tea in the Tang Dynasty, we get the advent of tea where we start seeing brand new kilns open up, the production of teacups and teaware and his 26 types of tea utensils. Or it creates a whole new industry. And so there are a lot of people that are jumping on board with this new new wave of popularity of tea culture. We get the, the celadon glaze. We get the, those really nice green glaze cups and stuff. And it just keeps rising in the Song Dynasty. The Song Dynasty, we finally get actually like brand name teas tea cakes we get we get the beginning of fake teas <laughs> we get we get uh tea cakes that are made outside of the region they're supposed to be made by different vendors that are trying to make them look like the famous tea cakes that are the tribute tea cakes to the emperor and stuff like that and so the idea that fake tea and and knockoff tea and tea from not the authentic source this happens as early as the song dynasty so it's been happening for over a thousand years and so it's not now no surprise that it's happening now as well in the song dynasty we also get all the different kilns the song have the five kilns like the ru ru yao we get the guan yao the gu yao the ge yao and we also get the the jen jian those like metallic glaze cups and so we see just a huge wave of tea culture coming in the song dynasty but they're still drinking tea as powder they're still the preparation of tea takes so many steps. It requires so many utensils. It's really the drink of the literati, of, of the higher class people, because the poorer people, they can't afford all the specific tea utensils you need to make tea, the, the way you're supposed to make it and stuff. And so tea at this time is still a far, far stretch from what you would get in the Ming dynasty and the end of the Yuan dynasty, which I'm so excited. We're about to get there. And so finally, finally at the end of the Yuan Dynasty, at the beginning of the Ming Dynasty, we see our first pan-fried de-enzymated tea. And I am so excited about this because this is when tea really begins for me. All this history about tea before that, it's so far away from what I consider tea, I don't even want to think about it. And so the first idea of this de-enzymated tea, this pan-fried tea we get, comes in a mention in the 1400s in the Wuyi Mountains in, in Fujian. And they're talking about withering, oxidizing, and pan-frying these teas. By the, by the middle of the 1500s, we get primary source material, noting there are over 50 different types of famous tea, famous loose-leaf tea. Among them, we have Longjing, we have Wuyi, we have places in Zhang, Jiangsu and Yixing, we have Suzhou. A lot of green teas are really coming around at this time. However, with the processing, we're probably looking at something that's a, a little between green tea and oolong tea. We're getting semi, semi-oxidized because, let's face it, their understanding of oxidization and their, their methodology of production, it's not very refined. But with time and practice, we see more and more people drinking loose leaf, de-enzymated tea. And it's really interesting because with this, the Yuan dynasty was the Mongol dynasty. This is an influence of out external cultures. And we get the beginning of the Silk Road and this confluence of ideas and sciences going back and forth. This is when supposedly noodles get to Italy and a lot of information comes into China and we see this processing develop and it really doesn't take hold. The loose leaf tea really doesn't take hold until the first Ming Dynasty Emperor Tai Zhu or Zhu, Zhu Yuan Zhang in 1368 to 1398 notices that everyone's drinking loose leaf tea. And yet the imperial tribute teas are still these powdered tea cakes. And he says, you know what? I want that loose leaf stuff. And as soon as he does that, as soon as he says loose leaf tea is now tribute tea, the development and production quality of loose leaf tea just skyrockets. And it's never the same. This is the absolute game changer and brings us into the modern tea world. So thank you, Zhu Yanzhong. Thank you, Emperor Taizu. Now, while tea was very famous in the Tang Dynasty and the Song Dynasty, We've never seen it grow in popularity as it does in the Ming Dynasty. This is when we get the development of teapots and teaware, like the Yixing takes off, the Yixing teapots take off. Jing De Zhen becomes the hub of creation for all, all types of porcelain. And we see this high-class and low-class social construct of 
drinking tea as a pastime, as a social contract, as something to do in inns, in towns, and villages, and, and essentially everywhere. And the reason is because brewing tea loose leaf is way easier than brewing it as a powder. So if you have a powdered a tea cake that you need to powder, you need a lot of equipment. You need a very specific process, and it's, it's very easy to make a bad product. But with tea leaves and tea leaves that are made so that you just add hot water to it and you can drink it, this opens up tea to literally everyone. And we see it just skyrocket in popularity. However, because of this, this kind of creates this dichotomy between, oh, the poor people can drink tea, the rich people need to set themselves apart. And so the rich people begin really talking about the the subtleties of tea. And this is when we get a lot of like this social satire. And we see this in uh, the Hong Lo Mong, the Dream of the Red Chamber. There's this brilliant scene where there's this hilarious scene where they're talking about the different grades of water where this young nun is making Bao Yu and Dai Yu tea. Her name is Miao Yu. And she's making tea, a special tea that she has. And Dai Yu, who's the tragic beauty of the, the story, she asks, oh, like, is this made with last year's rainwater? And <laughs> I'll, I'll quote from the translation, the, the monk Miao Yu, the nun Miao Yu says, oh, you really cannot tell the difference? I'm quite disappointed in you. This is melted snow that I collected from under the branches of wintering, winter flowering plum trees five years ago when I was living on the coiled incense temple on Mount Shuanmu. I am most surprised that you cannot tell the difference. When did stored rainwater have such buoyant lightness? How could one possibly use it for tea like this? And so we're seeing, even in the Ming Dynasty, even in the fiction, there's these satires, there's these jokes about how the taste of tea is being essentially used by the elites to kind of say, okay, like, the poor can drink tea, but they really don't know tea. And so <laughs> the tea snobbery has been around for 500, 1,000 years because I mentioned in the Song Dynasty they're already faking famous tea, famous tribute teas and whatnot. So it's in the Ming Dynasty that we see tea influencing all walks of life. We see it influencing the art. Artists and painters begin decorating landscapes and paintings with pastoral scenes of people drinking tea. And this is, again, like Lu Yu did with the classic of tea, like the Buddhists did with the Bodhidharma story and Lu Yu did with Shenong. This is the sanctification of tea. This is bringing tea into the Chinese cultural sphere and understanding. And so tea in the Ming Dynasty really becomes a household beverage. It's such a necessary staple that we see tea rations being issued even in times of famine, even in times of war, even under the communist governments of the Maoist era and stuff. People get their vegetable token they get their meat token they get their oil and salt they get their tea token and ration and it's really great we have some of these uh actual tea ration tea ration cards and it just is really interesting to see how this herb how this medicine has grown from prehistory as just medicine to part of daily life and so with that really brief overview of tea history out of the way now that we have de tea in the Ming Dynasty, we have loose-leaf tea, we have stuff that actually looks like what we would consider tea, we can finally start talking about how this grew into the different types of tea because at this time, there was still no black tea, green tea, oolong tea, red tea, dark tea, white tea. It was just tea from this region, tea from this region. And as I mentioned, most of it that's being made in the Ming Dynasty is a form of green tea or potentially oolong tea, but we're still not seeing these clear differentiations between the styles. In fact, the first evidence we get of black tea arises of red tea. In China, they call it hong cha, red tea. In the West, we call it black tea. The first instance of this is in the Tongmu region, right above Wuyi Shan, which is great because Wuyi is one of the birthplaces of tea, essentially, or like as far as like one of the earliest cultural hubs of tea production. The Ming Dynasty was Wu Shan, And so to see the, the new innovations of black tea coming out of there is really interesting. But that didn't happen until the mid-1800s. And so that's modern history, essentially. That's, what, 200, 220 years ago. So what I want to do in the next couple of episodes is get into these new types of tea, the white teas, the 
the oolong tea, the black tea, the red tea, and really talk about their origin, where they kind of came from, how their production differed, and how they were received and how they grew into modern times. So what I'm really excited to do is start looking at white tea next. Maybe I'll go back and I'll do an episode of famous Ming Dynasty teas because this is when we see Mongjing. This is when we see tea, like I said, from Yixing and Jiangsu. We see Wuyi Mountain teas, but the Wuyi teas are all green teas at this time. So it's, I'd be very curious to do a little research and see when the green Wuyi oolongs or when the green Wuyi teas became Wuyi oolongs and when it all differentiated from from one type of tea into all of these myriad different styles so thank you for listening i hope you learned a little bit about tea i hope you have your own thoughts about how tea has changed how tea grew you know a little bit more about the tea that you're drinking all the time the tea that's in your gaiwan or your teapot now where it came from where its origins came from and while i feel like i said a whole lot in this episode it's not enough there's there's so much more i didn't say i, I skated over Lu Yu. i skated over a lot of the innovations of, of tea history but again my goal here is not to create a tea history podcast there's a beautiful one already by lazo montgomery who does the chinese history podcast he has a, a tea history podcast and if you really want to get into the details go check him out because he's fantastic he is he's a legend in this podcasting industry in this chinese history chinese tea everything that he does is beautiful what i want to do though is really talk about my experience in modern china my experience sourcing teas the tea culture the people i meet the innovations we're seeing here right now and so this was essentially a preliminary episode that i felt like i had to kind of get out of the way so thank you for listening thank you for being here with me and i i'm really excited to start giving you more content so if you, if you like this give me a shout let me know i'll attach my information here i'll let you know where you can listen to the podcast and again i'm derek from one river tea i have the website one river tea.com we have a blog where we translate we have a youtube where i make videos if you're interested in trying any of our teas just check it out if you're interested in just saying hi follow us on instagram send me a message i love hearing about other tea cultures other people drinking tea and how they're enjoying this this wonderful beverage throughout the world so once again thanks for tuning into the very first episode of tea soup a podcast all about tea culture life in modern china and chinese tea this is derek from one river tea and until next time brew happy